it's recommended for around 56 grams a day for men and 45 grams a day for women of protein. Okay, that is what the British Dietetic Association talk about when we look at protein intakes. Yours is very different and you talk about it really well in the book and you go into how much protein we should be having and you recommend around 30 to 50 grams of high quality protein. That's also a really important kind of term just to reference that high quality protein we're going to go into that a bit more so people might be shocked they might also be on board already with this information but talk to me about your philosophy on why it's 30 to 50 grams per meal primary meal so let's just say three meals a day when we talk about protein we have to talk about what can we say that is evidence-based and that has some outcome of meaning. If you were to think about nitrogen balance studies, they were trying to figure out the minimum amount of protein and the cheapest way to feed these soldiers, these 18-year-old males, to mitigate the amount of protein, to optimize for carbohydrates because it's cheap. And that's where they came up with the minimum amount of dietary protein necessary to prevent deficiencies. To me, Nitrogen balance is not an outcome. The idea that someone would say, okay, well, this is the minimum to prevent deficiencies based on a nitrogen balance. I don't know where anything in medicine is based on a nitrogen balance. You're asking, why am I talking about that? Because it puts into perspective this whole conversation about how are you getting 30 to 50 grams? This amount of protein seems like it's a lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nitrogen balance is not a health outcome that we use or recognize versus muscle protein synthesis, which is a health outcome over time. It is muscle protein synthesis is the incorporation of amino acids into skeletal muscle that over time is believed to help pre prevent and protect against sarcopenia, to help manage lean body mass and skeletal muscle health. That for me is the outcome that I'm looking for. Therefore, 30 to 50 grams of dietary protein is what in the literature has been shown, especially if someone is older, more mature, old, over the age of 30, that will create that stimulus. And that is what I would base skeletal muscle health on. And that is where I base the recommendations, the way in which the recommendations come from. 30 to 50 grams at the first meal is probably the most important. And that's where we have all of the data because a first meal effect is much easier than later on uh, looking at, at other meals. When an individual is coming out of an overnight fast, this the body is primed to have a an action, right? And that action would be the incorporation in this muscle protein synthesis. An individual needs between 30, it needs a minimum of 30 grams to create that physiological process. And that is based on leucine, mm -hmm. which is one of the essential amino acids that skeletal muscle is exquisitely sensitive to. When you hit that, you set up your metabolism appropriately for the whole day. When you hit the 30 to 50 grams. Yes. And this is a bold statement. When you hit the 30 to 50 grams, what happens is, and especially if carbohydrates are controlled, you stimulate muscle protein synthesis and these initiation factors. You are in essence stimulating uh, what would be considered a biomarker for muscle health. That process could go on for two to five hours. Making that stimulation, getting that right, is the most critical. Because we don't really know how important that second meal is. We can argue that the last meal before bed is also important because you're going into an overnight fast. But what we can argue is that that first meal is critical. And when you nail protein, again, we talk about protein as if it's one thing. But protein is 20 different amino acids, all with unique biological roles, doesn't have one. They are not interchangeable. The There are the nine essentials, which are the ones that you must eat for. And when it relates to skeletal muscle health, you do need that stimulation of this leucine. That comes from high quality proteins. It is most abundant as all essential amino acids. That would be, say, whey protein, eggs, beef, chicken, turkey, fish, dairy products, Greek yogurt. If an individual is more plant-based, they are going to require, depending on what kind of plant products they're utilizing, they are uh -huh. going to require anywhere from 25 to 35 percent more of total uh -huh. protein to meet that leucine threshold. Yeah, you've got a whole, well, not a whole thing. You've got like a little box in your book saying that vegetarians consume approximately 65 grams of plant-based protein a day. And you're saying, but this amount is far too low. And I know, and there's two things, gosh, there's so much you say, and I'm like, I don't want to interrupt you, but I've got so much to ask you around this stuff. And I think there's twofold. I really want to 
touch upon this vegetarian diet quickly because I do know that we speak a lot around plant-based diets on the show as well. We had Dr. Will Boltzowicz on recently talking about gut health and fiber and how that relates. And so there's a lot of different information that we kind of bring onto the show on, you know, have more fiber, have more beans, have more plant-based foods to consume for your gut microbiome. We had Dr. Felice Jacaron talking about food and mood and obviously the connection there by the vagus nerve and how it's really important to have more plant-based foods in your diet. So there's two things. I really want to touch upon that and I really want to talk about the intermittent fasting because you just mentioned there, Lucy, which I found really interesting. So let's just start there on, if people are listening to this and going, okay, protein, and she's just listed lots of animal products there. And then then getting a little bit worried about obviously hearing a lot about the importance of gut health and fiber. What would you say to those listeners who are listening now who are also maybe advocating plant-based? So my question would be, why is it mutually exclusive? Why would it be all or nothing? Both are critical and not interchangeable. I absolutely agree with every statement that you've said about dietary fiber and how important it is to get beans. Beans are a great source of fiber. These are not what I would consider protein sources. They have amino acids, but these are not complete proteins. These are not an, this is not an ideal protein source. And certainly with plant sources of proteins comes a lot of carbs and you have to balance it. I I think that we need to have conversations that are inclusive of both because again, both are critical and not interchangeable. The idea that you would have an optimal protein diet and somehow that would mean that you wouldn't have fiber would not be the way that I would think about it. And I also think that we we have to consider we need both. 40% of women over the age of 65 are not meeting the baseline recommendations of protein. And they're the ones who actually really need it. Correct. And arguably, they're probably not getting enough fiber either. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to hierarchy, what is the hierarchy of health and wellness? And the hierarchy of health and wellness for me would be muscle health. Thanks so much for listening. To hear the full episode, there's a link in the description.